Hello, welcome back to the Midnight Quill podcast. In our second episode, we're talking about creating a main character. I'm one of your hosts, Tegan, also known as TC Emerus. I'm a writer, professional ghostwriter, and fiction editor. My debut short story collection, The Weight of Rain, was released last year. Now over to my co-hosts. Hi, I'm Maddie, or MJ Glenn. I run Softwood Self-Publishing, which helps authors through the entire self-publishing process. I've also published my own debut fantasy novel called On the Edge, which you can buy on Amazon now. Hi, I'm Janet, and I wrote a YA contemporary romance novel called New Beginnings, and it is out right now on Amazon for paperback and Kindle. The second part is actually coming out mid-February, and that's going to be called Between Two Worlds. So let's talk about creating main characters. What do you guys think is the first step to creating a main character for your work of fiction? I think um, the first step of creating a main character is to think about a problem that they have. I think the main character is essentially the bare bones of your story. Mm. So if you come up with um, a problem um, and two solutions, your character will be aiming for one solution that doesn't necessarily fix the problem. And then throughout the story, they will find that the second solution is actually the best way to go. So I think the problem is the first place to start. Yeah, yeah, I think that's I think that's really good if you're if you have a plot in mind, especially already, and then you can build off of that. Yeah, Janet, what do you think? For for me, it was um how I wanted her, what I wanted Ida to do. Like I know I wanted yeah. Ida to be a fierce friend. I know I wanted to show her like defending this big you know kind of tall guy who can obviously take care of himself but I just I wanted her to show that she's willing to you know put herself in front of him like in a fight so I just kind of started with things I knew I wanted her to do and then it just kind of yeah just kind of came naturally from there and yeah yeah that's I think that's really interesting that you've both sort of started with a particular idea I'm not sure if everyone does that I mean um for me sometimes the characters come first and sometimes the plot comes first what was interesting with my novel on the edge was for the first time my character came first um and I had to try and create some plot from this from this female highway woman outlaw character I had to create some kind of plot and actually I found that quite difficult yeah um so I, I already had a sort of an idea of her personality traits and I had to work out her problems and how she'd try and solve them. Yeah, interesting. Um, I think it's the same with me, actually, for some of the stories in The Weight of Rain. Uh, Wilfred is the first that comes to mind. Um, I started with the character of Wilfred and then I sort of thought, like, uh, what, what do I do with him? What plot can I make around him? Let's talk about likability. I think this is something that we touched on in Show Don't Tell, and it's certainly something that I have strong opinions about. Um, Do we think that a main character needs to be likable? I think there's an issue with calling a character likable because in Mm. real life, um, you like a character if they are humble and nice and they are friendly. In a story... You don't, you don't necessarily like a character because of their morals. Take James Bond, for example. He kills lots of people he doesn't need to kill, but he's cool and he saves damsels in distress. Yeah. So the idea of likable is quite difficult for some people to get their heads around because likable in a story is slightly different to likable in reality. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, Janet, I know you've, you've said that uh, some of your readers find Ida unlikable, which I... I like really that that hurts me because she's fantastic but um what yeah. what do you think when you were setting her up did you think like she's a likable character or did you not care about that you were more interested in I didn't care I wanted to be true to her like I she I think a character needs to be relatable and for Ida's situation I mean she's a pregnant teenager she just lost her best yeah. friend in an accident she's going to a foreign country that she's never been to before likable isn't probably the least thing on her mind yeah so it's that was for me it was the least thing on my mind I just wanted to get her be true to her um try to make her relatable because not everyone pregnant or not foreign country or not not everyone's walking around all bubbly and happy you know she's you know she's just trying to get through life and yeah yeah I think that I think that's really important 
everyone's just trying to get through life and main characters are no different they don't know they're the main character in the story we're writing the story with them as the main character but they're not they're not thinking i'm the most important person in this story (laughs) you know they're just trying to live what you said about being relatable though that's really interesting um and i think that's something we we touched on genre last time and i think that's something that's really interesting to have a character who's relatable for your genre maddie what do you think about that I kind of struggle with the word relatable. I never really know how to think about it or what that really means. I suppose I don't really know what I consider to be relatable. I think that um, relatability can come in in ways that isn't always overt. And I think that's why I get frustrated with with ideas of genre, um, especially with YA, um, this idea that uh, to be relatable, your character has to be almost a stereotype. Like sometimes um, teenage characters are so stereotyped just to be relatable. And Ida definitely isn't that, just for the record. She's fantastic. And I think that's why she works as a, as a main character because she's relatable in a way that isn't stereotypical. I find it difficult that people think that characters have to be relatable in terms of their age. Why do you have to read a character that is your age? Yeah. Why can't an adult read a character that's 16 years old? And why can't a 16 year old read a character that's 40 years old? I don't see, you know, so relatable, I think is quite a difficult word to unpick because there's very specific things that you could relate to that the author may not even intended yeah absolutely so how can we make sure that our main characters feel real without this idea of plot armor and script immunity becoming an issue so for our listeners um plot armor or script immunity that the two terms are used quite inter- interchangeably is this idea that the main character is uh throughout the story it's clear that they are the most important person throughout and so you have issues like well they're not going to die are they the reader may feel that there's no stakes because a if a main character is protected by this plot armor um, where's the, where's the tension going to come from? Um, so how can we make sure that we're, we're not letting plot armor get in the way? I think it's important for an author to think about how a character will change because of a situation. Of mm. course, the reader knows that the main character isn't going to die, but they don't know how the character might change and how that might change their actions in future or how other people may respond to them. I think that's where a lot of tension comes from. Right. Yeah, I agree. So, I mean, life at risk isn't as important. Like Maddie was saying, it's something like giving them an, an obstacle. Like, are they going to, or are they, well, they won't, you know, as I does not thrilled with the pregnancy. Is she going to keep the baby? Is she not? Yeah. So, so we can have um, narrative paths without um, having to worry about, you know, the main character being completely destroyed in the process and sometimes it can be nice to read a story and think well this person's going to be okay in the end but I want to see what happens to them along the way. Also um, in terms of relatability if we think of ourselves as the main character we don't think we are going to die do we? we don't think about that every day we're more focusing on how we're going to change and our relatability to other people and emotions and how things might affect us. So I think that's what we're looking for in a character, in a main character. We're looking for how the world changes them and how they react to the world. This brings me nicely onto my next point, I think. What are some main character tropes that you hate to see uh, on, you know, on TV and movies as well, but uh, in, in, in your reading, your personal reading? I'm a bit tired of the sexy guy <laughs> the guy who is just there because he's sexy and he's got massive muscles and he's just I don't know he tends to be sarky and a bit nasty but the girl fancies him because he has big muscles yeah yeah I completely agree is th- is this all tying to your your thing about James Bond Maddie because I think you mentioned him last time as well <laughs> I don't know. I think I have um, an issue. I was recently told that my character is unlikable because she kills people. Um, And that made me go on a bit of a tirade. And that's why I came up with the idea of James Bond. James Bond isn't a very nice person. He just saves people. The, yeah. He just saves us the vague world all the time, but he's not actually a nice person. And just because he's a man, he's allowed to go and pe- kill people. 
However, my main character is a girl, is a 16 year old girl, and some people find issue with her killing people. Now she doesn't kill people out of the blue. She's doing it to survive. She's doing it for her job. She's doing it, you know, for, for reasons. We may not agree with them, but there are reasons. Yeah. And there are also many other things that make her vulnerable and make her relatable. I think what um, this makes me think of is that we need more variety in the main characters. Have we seen too many plain men doing adventurous things? I think so. I think we want some variety. We want some, like, some younger people, some older people, people who have experienced different things. I feel sorry for the men out there who <laughs> aren't those people. Who, yes. Who aren't those sort of buff action figure types where are their main characters why yeah. they can't relate to any other male characters predominantly in ya and fantasy i suppose yeah why why can't we have a musician i mean i'm biased because my, <laughs> my fiance is a musician but why can't we have a, a musician main character or an artist main character who is a man who doesn't have muscles who likes yeah. painting I know it's and I think that's I think that is actually something that's changing in, in in literature at the moment is we are getting a greater variety of people because you know we need some realism with with our main characters. I think there's an element of fiction where we want to use it as escapism so we want the characters that we dream of and I think in the last year because we've been in such a weird situation and we've missed family that we never thought we'd miss and we've missed things we never thought we'd miss mm. we've started to see people for who they are and I think we're more interested in the complexities of people not just the people that we wish for not the people that we wish to be yeah. I think we're more interested in seeing complex people individuals who don't just play into a fantasy role I don't mean fantasy as in the genre. I mean a sort of fantastical role. Yeah, like a, a um, fantasized uh, yeah. ideal. Or yeah, I yeah, I think you're absolutely right there. Janet, what what's your least favorite main character trope in your reading? Do you think? I don't get. I don't like the dumb jock anymore. Jocks, <laughs> you can play a sport and still be smart. Still be clever. Yeah. You can, can get through your school day without needing the help of a the nerdy girl and you can still get your scholarship I don't know I so yeah I would say the I'm getting sick of the dumb jock yeah oh another one I've got is the really pretty girl who's really shy and doesn't think she's pretty oh yeah and I, th I think maybe we're touching on some YA tropes more and maybe because I'm speaking to two quote unquote <laughs> YA authors because we have talked about you know what genre actually means for a, a writer before and you know anyway we'll talk about that another time because it's long um <laughs> but I think we are touching on some YA tropes um do you think that YA main characters are like significantly different from adult fiction main characters and why and what do you not like about that I think YA has a tendency to fall into more tropes than any other genre. Maybe because the considered readers of YA, which is, you know, the young adults, are only just learning about the kinds of personalities in the world. So they, so it, there's a need to box people into these personalities. And I think it's important for those young adult readers to learn about different kinds of people and different ways of looking at the world that mm. aren't just boxed into very simple sort of dramatic character types. The, the type of you know adults that I read in like rom-coms they all they're not really super mature like mm. for that I have come across I don't really I don't really read like a lot of like mystery novels or anything like that mm. I mostly am you know rom-com YA I re they really they all the at least like the females characters they do have this level of you know immaturity yeah I think and lightheartedness that that I you also find in in a teenager mm. do you think maybe that's more to do with romance than than YA then it must be yeah mm -hmm. just interesting 
because it's lighthearted, keep that lighthearted uh, yeah. thing. And we want the girl to be a little bit quirky, you know, and can't make her too perfect. I do find it interesting that some adult characters can seem less mature than real adults um, and they can behave quite immaturely. Um, for example, when when some when a situation could be solved just by telling the truth or just by explaining something more clearly um, and instead the character just doesn't tell the truth. I saw this in Downton Abbey a lot where the, the characters just where the characters just don't tell the truth, don't say exactly what's happening and it causes issues and it just like that's not real, that's just not real. It, I know your characters don't have to be perfectly real all the time. It just doesn't feel realistic that a character would leave out such important information just so that the plot can ca have some kind of yeah. difficulty and problem. But they, but they talk about leaving it out. Like you get to hear about their struggle. Like, oh gosh, I need to, I, why am I not telling him? I need to tell him. And then just don't. And then they have this conversation with the him that they need to talk to and nothing is said. And you're just like, well, why? So um, frustrating. Why? So frustrating. Yeah. I really wanted to talk about this idea of a blank slate character. Um, so a blank slate character, the best example I can think of is Bella Swan in Twilight. A lot of people have talked about how she's sort of a, a blank slate for the average uh, white teenage girl to sort of imagine their fantasy of, you know, getting with this vampire <laughs> I don't know I, I've never been into Twilight so it's a little bit difficult for me to to understand but I know that it was a really big phenomenon and I don't know if um the author uh Stephanie Meyer like intended for Bella Swan to be such a blank slate um but you know do do, do we think that's a technique to make our characters a blank slate on purpose so that the reader can um you know put themselves in the position even more or do you think that readers actually do prefer a little bit more complexity. Bella Swan does seem to break a lot of rules that writers set for themselves in, in terms of making a character um, and people liked her. I liked the second book because she has a lot more substance to her in the second book. Mm. Um, some readers may be well read enough to be able to know how to put themselves into a character and it doesn't matter what their character mm. thinks or feels or what the context of the character is, they'll still put themselves in. I don't think it works so well with a new reader, somebody who hasn't read so much of the genre or of any kind of book, because they need to, you kind of need to learn how to start relating to characters. Kind of, you just get used to it. You get used to feeling like you are one with the character or you recognize them or you're, I don't know, you're friends with them or something. Um, so I think, I just think Bella Swan's a bit of a Marmite character, you know? I don't know if you get that in America. In England, Marmite is a love or hate topic. So <laughs> we kind of call it a Marmite anything. <laughs> yeah, for, for our listeners who, who aren't British, Marmite is a um, savoury spread that you put on toast and the uh, advertising campaign is either love it or hate it because typically people either think it's disgusting or, or really like it. I think it's delicious, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think Bella is, is a good example of a Marmite character because yeah. for those people who are expecting a complex character, they're going to be disappointed. And for those people who want to sort of um, <laughs> get into her mindset, it's very easy to do because <laughs> there's nothing there. <laughs> um, Jan <laughs> Janet, what do you think about um, Blank Slate main characters? You know, I really want, I really hope that readers want a complex character. Yeah. I mean, but unfortunately, it's not quite the case because, yeah, if there's a complex character, there's there's so much for them to pick apart. So, yeah, unfortunately, with the Bella, the only thing you can pick her apart for being a blank slate. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's no other really character. There's nothing else to attack. Yeah, that's true. There. Yeah, the only, the only, really the only thing she has going for her is Edward. I think it's really interesting that at the beginning of this podcast, I was saying how you need to create a character from a problem. Mm -hmm. um, and Bella Swan doesn't seem to have that problem. Yeah. The only thing that her problem is, I guess, is she falls into another, you know, trope about not coming from a stable family. Mm -hmm. or, 
not a whole family, I guess. Like, you know, her mom's quirky. She's taking care of her mom. Mm, yeah. Um, taking care of her dad too, basically cooking his meals and stuff. I mean, yeah, they're fine without her. They're getting along, but. Yeah, I think that I was talking to someone the other day about um, protagonists being orphans. And um, there was a, a post I was uh, replying to the other day the the prompt was um, write a um, book in just one sentence and somebody wrote um, an orphaned boy is taken in by his aunt and uncle and finds out that he um, is special and will defeat a bad guy right <laughs> and most people said Harry Potter and he said no not Harry Potter and I was like oh okay not Harry Potter and then I said Aragon Oh, um, I was thinking Aragon. And then he said, no, not Aragon. And it was Star Wars. It's, oh, yeah. the, it's the same thing. So what is this thing of protagonists, particularly those are sort of young protagonists, young male protagonists, being like orphans raised by their aunt and uncle? How interesting. I think about it because the readership of that genre kind of likes to put themselves in such a risky situation you know a dangerous situation your parents when you're a teenager your parents are looking after you and you're safe in their house and that feels boring as opposed to read about for a teenager's perspective <clears throat> um and maybe it's quite exciting to read about a character who has no family safety network mm. and has to work it out all for themselves um yeah do you think maybe it's a, a matter of plot convenience in some ways because if you have a a young you know YA or or child character who uh, they have a family there to support them it's going to be difficult for them to have adventures isn't it because <laughs> there's a series of books that I absolutely love called the Septimus Heap Chronicles mm -hmm. um there's about seven of them I think and it's centered around a very happy family home and they all have quite amazing adventures like you have to give them another problem so mm -hmm. You know, like uh, to go back to, to Ida, that's the only thing I know right now because I'm immersed in editing books. <laughs> she is, um, she comes from a very stable family, mm. but so she needed another problem, you know, so her, her pregnancy. I mean, you can come from a stable family and still make mistakes. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. So in the Septimus Heap Chronicles, um, Septimus, the main character, finds out that he was adopted and they found him as a baby abandoned. Um, and so his problem, I suppose, is his identity. He doesn't quite know who his family are. Should he find his real parents, you know? Um, and I suppose that is the extra problem put on that starts the whole series. Yeah. The final thing I wanted us to discuss um, was talking about growth, uh, character growth for our main characters. Is is it something that's achievable to have strong personal growth and change maybe whilst also having a strong plot? Character growth has to be intertwined with the plot. Mm. The, I think in fact, the plot essentially is based around the character growth. So as I said earlier, I think you start a character with a problem and they have two solutions. One of the solutions will uh, doesn't work it doesn't fix the issue it might be a might fix the issue for temporarily but it essentially doesn't work and it's the easy way out and the other solution is what they will learn to do through the plot the plot will teach them that that's the better way to go True, let's take my book for an example the development of my character ebony is to do with feeling you know being able to trust other people um and being able to accept a family environment that she's not used to and so in the plot the plot kind of forces her into development hmm. into character development so for me i kind of found you know laying down the law you know right from the start about who this person is their flaws and and whatnot and then the growth just came naturally you know hmm. the plot um for ida she i guess she really doesn't change too much um she starts she starts out She's got, well, obviously she's pregnant, but that's not her. Um, she has anxiety issues. She doesn't like being in crowds. At the end of the book, she still has anxiety. She still doesn't like being in crowds. Yeah. Yeah, but I think that um, 
the fact that she doesn't change in some ways is is a growth as well because um i think a lot of the times with romance maybe this is my bias towards romance um the woman is often changing for the men do you know what i mean right. um and so sometimes that is actually a personal growth to be solid enough to not bend and change throughout um throughout difficulties yeah because I suppose a growth in a character could be also accepting their own problems mm. they could start not acknowledging them and by the end completely accept them and say okay that's just me and let's work with it and mm. this is who I am and that can be a growth and I think that can be important for people to learn that they don't have to be perfect they don't have to move through their anxiety if they just come to terms with it and understand it and don't let it control them I think that's a really good development for people to learn yeah definitely I think that's a really uh, good point to end on I think we've spoken about everything we want to say about main characters leave us a like and a comment uh, down below uh, what are some of your least favorite main character tropes uh, are they the same as the ones that we talked about or are there are some other things that uh, really get your gears grinding thank you very much for listening and make sure you join us next week for our next episode thank you very much to Janet Olson for being our guest today uh, make sure you go and check out uh, New Beginnings on Amazon and look out for the second book in the series. Thanks very much for listening and we'll see you next time.